Welcome back to the channel. I'm Alfred Avenue, and I am excited to bring you guys another EA Sports College Football 25 Dynasty Deep Dive video. In this one, we're going to be talking about recruiting and player progression. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into this video. It's a long one. Build your program. There's no question that in today's world, roster management and talent acquisition are at the forefront of college football and building your program. Players can now transfer whenever they want and they have expectations for you and your program. Some are looking to play early, others want to win championships and play in big time games, and stars want to grow their brand beyond the field. Aligning what you and your program can do for them has never been more important. We began our design process by talking with current and former coaches, players, and recruiting experts. What is recruiting and roster management like in the current era? How have player motivations changed? What causes a player to transfer? What differentiates a big time program from a smaller school when it comes to how they operate on the recruiting trail? At the same time, we spent a ton of time doing quantitative research. We want to know anything and everything about recruiting and program management. This ranged from how many five star, four star, and three star prospects there are every year to what makes a California quarterback different from a Florida quarterback. We focused heavily on the different geographic regions and what they are known for, as well as researching the recruiting journeys of hundreds of prospects. Why did they ultimately sign to the schools that they did? What did the schools in their top five and top three have in common with each other? Why did they visit some schools but not others? What role did the head coach and coordinators play in their recruiting process? Lastly, we spent time talking with our community on what they expected from recruiting and program management. Players liked the recruiting in older games because it had depth, but it was also tedious at times. On the contrary, the latest iteration was fast, but it was also shallow and cold. You never actually felt like you were establishing a relationship with the prospect. We wanted to find a way to blend the two so that recruiting felt meaningful and allowed you to build a connection with recruits through discovery while also being conscious of your time each week. Ultimately, we landed on four core goals when building your program. Humanize recruits by giving them unique needs and motivations that the player has to discover by interacting with the recruit. Differentiate regions of the country by player caliber, quality, and type to authentically capture high school talent based on historical real-world data. Represent the different resources available to schools ensuring the top schools can blanket the country, while smaller schools will need to be more targeted with their approach. Make the transfer portal feel authentically unpredictable. Welcome to Staged Recruiting. In College Football 25, we are introducing a new staged recruiting experience built around three distinct phases, discovery, pitch, and close. Just like the real world, every recruit will be in a different stage of the process. Recruiting begins with discovery. In this initial stage, you are finding which prospects to target, what their skills are, and what they care about most. This stage is all about uncovering information about the recruit as quickly as possible. The sooner you can discover how well they align with your program, the better, as time is of the essence. <laughs> Once a recruit announces their top five schools, it's time to pitch. During the pitch phase, you are selling the recruit on your program and what you offer. How well your school aligns with their motivations will determine how successful you are. The final stage is to close. This is when you bring the recruit in for an official visit and attempt to leave a lasting impression about your program. If the visit goes well, you'll make huge gains with the recruit and possibly secure a verbal commitment following the visit. Ultimately, the recruit will make their final decision on National Signing Day. Before we dive deeper into each of these, let's start by discussing how every program and recruit is unique. My school. When we talk about there being 134 different ways to play, we're talking about more than just on-field gameplay. Every school is graded from D- to A+, across 14 different categories, which comprise their My School grades. These grades define who a program is and what their strengths and weaknesses are. No two programs are the same, and the grades will dynamically change over the course of your dynasty based on school performance and actions. The 14 grades are as follows. Playing time. This represents how long it will take for a player to become a starter at their position. Playing time is individualized to each recruit and player based on their position group and overall. Playing style. This is a representation of how you play. Every player archetype has a stat that is tracked over the course of the season. How high that stat is relative to other teams determines your grade. For example, field general quarterback's playing style grade is driven by passing yards per game. Championship Contender. This measures how close the team is to winning a championship. It takes into account the team's current ranking and roster composition. Program Tradition. 
This is a holistic view of a program's history and success over time based on the number of conference and national championships, total wins, and awards won. Campus lifestyle. This is a representation of the city and area surrounding the campus, as well as the campus itself. This grade cannot be changed or impacted. Stadium atmosphere. This is driven by the stadium's toughest places to play ranking, which is determined by a team's historical performance in home games. Pro potential. This is a projection of how likely it is that players on the current roster will play on Sundays. Brand exposure. This grades a team's overall brand recognition, the potential NIL opportunities a player could get at the school, and how often the school plays in primetime games. Academic prestige. This ranks all universities based on real-world academic rankings. This grade cannot be changed. Conference prestige. This represents the overall strength of a conference based on each conference member's team prestige. Coach prestige. This is a reflection of the school's coaching staff. The head coach carries the most weight here, but coordinators are also taken into account. Coach stability. This measures how long the coaching staff has been in place and how likely they are to remain there for the next four years. Athletic facilities. This grade measures the quality of athletic facilities for the program. Waterfalls and barbershops are a plus here. Proximity to home. This grade is unique to each recruit and is based on where the school is in relation to the recruit's home pipeline. Each grade has a unique set of grading criteria. For example, playing time is graded on a per player basis. The player's overall or projected overall if they are a recruit is compared to the team's roster to project how many years it will take for them to become a starter. Actions you take on the recruiting trail will impact the playing time grade of both recruits and players on your current roster. Even if a player is a starter today, signing new players in recruiting may negatively impact their playing time grade and cause them to enter into the transfer portal. On the other hand, Championship Contender uses a combination of your top 25 poll ranking, team prestige, and an assessment of your current roster quality with Bud Elliott's blue chip ratio, which looks at the percentage of your roster that is made up of four and five star players. Finally, there's brand exposure, which is a reflection of your school's brand and the potential NIL opportunities a player could earn at your school. While you won't see players having a mustard named after them in College Football 25, recruits and transfers alike will assess their NIL earning potential and branding opportunities when considering where to go. Most grades update dynamically throughout the season, while some only update at the end of every season. It's important to keep tabs on your grades throughout the season and how you are trending because a slide in your grades could trigger decommitments from verbally committed recruits or a sudden transfer portal exodus at the end of the season. Your grades also play a pivotal role in recruiting and will determine how well your pitches land with a recruit. You can see all of your grades and detailed information about them in the My School screen, which can be accessed from the Recruiting Hub. This screen allows you to access your school's current strengths and weaknesses, as well as how to improve each grade to become a stronger program. Highlighting a grade will show you the steps you can take to improve it. Highlighting a grade will show you the steps you can take to improve it, where you are currently ranked amongst other teams, as well as the players who are at risk of transferring because they have a deal breaker attached to that grade. More on deal breakers and why a player would decide to leave later. Each week, the game will surface this information to you in a weekly summary, allowing you to quickly see the health of your program and any changes. The My School Report will show you grades that were positively or negatively impacted by your actions in the last week, as well as any grades that have players who are at risk of transferring if it gets too low. Collectively, your My School grades form your team prestige, which can be thought of as your My School GPA. Team Prestige grades teams from 0 to 5 stars in half star increments based on their current My School grades. Very few programs will achieve elite 5 star status and even fewer will be able to maintain it for a prolonged period of time. Ultimately, Team Prestige plays a pivotal role in recruiting and the caliber of players who want to play for your program. Recruits and where they come from. Each season, more than 3,500 recruits are generated from across the country. Just like the real world, every class is different. Some years have a plethora of great quarterback talent, while others have fewer great prospects. Similarly, the quantity and quality of prospects from each region of the country will vary. Certain regions will be more consistent in the caliber, quality, and type of recruits they can produce than others. For example, Southern California is known for producing great quarterback talent, while East Texas consistently produces some of the best wide receivers in the country. However, we didn't stop there. 
we wanted to go deeper to ensure we were capturing the authenticity of high school talent. Yes, East Texas is known for producing great receivers, but more specifically, they are known for how big and physical their receivers are. As a result, you're going to see bigger and more physical receivers coming out of East Texas. Whereas South Florida is going to produce incredibly fast, deep threat receivers who have a smaller size. What a recruit cares about. There are 14 different motivations a recruit can care about, all of which map one-to-one -one with the my school grades described above. Which motivations they care about are influenced by their star rating. A five-star prospect is gonna care more about getting to the next level, winning championships, and growing their brand with NIL opportunities than a two-star will. By contrast, a two-star is more likely to care about staying close to home, coach stability, and academics. Every recruit will have three motivations that they care about. These three motivations form what we call their ideal pitch. During the discovery stage, your job as a recruiter is to find their ideal pitch as fast as possible to determine whether or not they align with your program. If a recruit doesn't align with your program, you're going to have an uphill battle to sign them. There's a chance that one of their three ideal pitch motivations is also a deal breaker. Deal breakers represent a motivation that a recruit is extremely passionate about and will not budge on. If you do not satisfy their deal breaker, they won't talk with you. Additionally, a deal breaker stays with a player forever. So once they're on your roster, they'll still have the same deal breaker they had when you recruited them to your school. You can think of this like your promise to them. If you fail to uphold your side of the deal, there's a chance they might decide to enter the transfer portal at the end of the season. Recruiting pipelines. When we analyzed historical recruiting data, it was clear that even in today's day and age, recruiting is still highly regionalized. We discussed various recruiting strategies and tactics with current and former coaches, in particular how they handled recruiting in different areas of the country. All of our research and discussion led us to a new way of thinking about pipelines in College Football 25. First and foremost, it was clear that not every state is created equal when it comes to recruiting talent and pipelines. Having a pipeline in Florida is much more valuable than having one in New York. This made clear that the traditional approach of having each state be its own pipeline wouldn't accurately represent the recruiting landscape. One of our goals was to balance pipelines in terms of quantity and quality of recruits that come from them, as well as how schools tend to look at them. The result was reshaping pipelines to represent a geographic region rather than a state. For example, Florida is now broken into three different pipelines, North Florida, Central Florida, and South Florida. Similarly, Metro Atlanta is its own pipeline, whereas New York and New Jersey were combined to become a single pipeline. In total, there are still 50 pipelines in College Football 25, even though they don't get represented individually by the states. With our newly shaped pipelines, the next step was to look at every school's recruiting classes each of the last 10 years to identify which parts of the country they primarily recruit in. Using this data, we developed a tiered ranking system to represent how strong a school is in a given pipeline. Each pipeline has five levels and every school was given a pipeline level based on historical data. The higher your pipeline level, the stronger your influence is in the region. This will boost a recruit's initial interest in your school and the impact of your pitches. A school's pipeline level will never change, which ensures that schools who are historically strong recruiters in a given region will always have an advantage. For example, Florida has historically dominated recruiting in Central Florida in areas like Lakeland, Tampa, and Orlando. Similarly, LSU regularly reaches into East Texas and all along the Gulf Coast. This also accurately reflects the challenges of recruiting to a small school that is not located in or adjacent to a strong pipeline. Generally speaking, your school's pipelines will heavily influence the types of players you will be able to get and where they are from. The bonuses for being the highest tier in a pipeline are extremely strong, and schools are incentivized to recruit their pipeline. As Oregon, expect to compete often with the likes of Washington and USC for players in Southern California and Arizona. <clears throat> While I see this as a really cool like update to the system, it does bum me out that you can't over the next 10 years do better at playing and recruiting and increase your level within that pipeline and so essentially your small school will always be a small school within the pipeline and so like you'll never be able to like become that powerhouse really i'm hoping this doesn't limit that 
arena of recruiting. Together, pipelines and deal breakers create a much more realistic and less exploitable recruiting experience. While it's still possible to land four stars as a small school, it will require the right fit and a heavy investment of resources and time. Our hope is that you will no longer have to make a custom house rules in your online dynasty to prevent your friend from cheesing the system. While I understand that, in today's day and age, I still think it would be really fun to get recruits outside of your typical pipeline based on recent play. But for smaller schools, at least initially, you absolutely do better in your region with smaller players. But it's like, it's kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy of like, if I'm always going to be a small school who can't recruit big talent, like, I'll never be able to get out of this cycle of being a small bad school but we'll we'll just have to see initial interest and in top schools every recruit will start with a list of schools that they are interested in when a recruit generates their initial top schools list they evaluate every school's my school grades in relation to their ideal pitch and motivations they also take into account their home pipeline and proximity to home this means that recruits from Atlanta are more likely to have schools from the Southeast in their initial top schools. However, some prospects will look to leave home and play for a school further away if schools outside the region better fit their needs or if they don't consider any schools in the area good enough for them. Similarly, most of the top schools for a prospect who values academics are going to be very similar to one another. For example, as Rice, you will often see that the recruits who are interested in your school are also interested in Vanderbilt, Northwestern, and Stanford due to their high academic prestige. Depending on the motivations and location of a recruit, it is possible for them to be open to hearing from any school or already narrowed down to a top eight or even the top five. Once recruiting starts, recruits will narrow down their top schools over time, going from open to top eight to top five, top three, and ultimately commitment. Your job is to stay above the cut line each week. Great recruiters will quickly recognize losing battles and pivot their resources to a different prospect with more promise of commitment. After advancing the week, you will be shown a recruiting summary of any changes in recruit statuses, so you can quickly identify where you need to spend your time that week. Stage one, discovery. The first stage of recruiting, this is gonna be my favorite part. I love recruiting. Recruiting has always been my favorite thing um, and is kind of the lifeblood of the storytelling in the game and being able to like create your own dynasty and make the team your own. I am pumped for it. Stage one, discovery. The first stage of recruiting is discovery, where your goal is to learn information about the prospect as quickly as possible. The faster you can learn information about the prospect, the sooner you can decide whether or not to pursue them. Discovering intel and information about the recruit is also pivotal in how you craft your pitch and sell your school to the recruit. Uncovering that information before your competition gives you a huge advantage. Prospect identification. Discovery starts with prospect identification. You can find prospects to recruit from the prospect list. The prospect list defaults to the recommended filter, which identifies recruits who would be a good fit for you. The recommended filter uses the same logic as the AI when they are identifying players to recruit. It takes into account your team position needs, what pipeline a recruit is from, a recruit's interest in your school, and their star rating. You can quickly filter the list by using the L2 left trigger position filter or the R2 right trigger filters, which allow you to filter by top prospects, star rating, and state. If you'd like more control in your search, you can use the advanced search feature by pressing triangle or Y from within the prospect list. Advanced search allows you to search for prospects that match a specific set of criteria. You can search for recruits using the following criteria. Position, player type, archetype, state, minimum star rating, weight, height, handedness for quarterbacks only, and interest in your school. This actually was one of the ways that I was able to recruit more effectively than um, the people around me in online dynasties because you can find a player who's like a two star or three star, you know, or with like a 70 overall at like wide receiver. But if you set his height at like six five or six six, weight over 220, um, and then check to like he has really good hands, but you know, maybe his catching traffic isn't good. He might not be as fast, but you can get a guy who's sure handed on the ball, can catch in traffic, jump over opposing players. 
um, who will start for you next year, but might not be what you would see as a typical like five-star player at 78 overall, well-rounded. Like they'll have these specific things that they can be good at based on what you recruit for. And I always like to start with like interest of school, at least at the beginning to kind of filter out, okay, who's good, who's bad, who should I, who should I uh, scout first and things along those lines. When viewing a recruit in the prospect list, you will be able to see bio information about the recruit, as well as key recruiting information like whether or not they have a deal breaker, if they satisfy a team need, how interested they are in your school, their recruiting stage, and how many scholarship offers they have. Once you find a recruit you're interested in, you can go ahead and add them to your board by pressing X or A. Keep in mind that you can only have 35 prospects on your recruiting board at a given time. This is similar to the previous game, and I think it's a healthy amount. It doesn't let you get too many good players at once. Now, if you're getting your 25 scholarship players, all five-star and four-star, you're going to be a powerhouse no matter what. Uh, but I think this is a, a good thing that they've kept on from the older games. Team needs. When setting up your board, it's important to understand your current roster strengths and weaknesses. How many players are graduating next season? How many returning starters are you going to have? Within any of the recruiting screens, you can press R3 or right stick to quickly see your needs at every position. The team needs spreadsheet will show you an overall letter grade for each position, as well as a breakdown by school year for the players who are currently on your roster. It will also show you how many additional players you need at the position and the number of players you've signed and targeted at that position. How many players you need at a position will vary by scheme. For example, if you run a pass-heavy offensive scheme like the veer and shoot, you will need 10 wide receivers, whereas a pro-style offense only needs 6. Your scheme is tied to your playbook, and the only way to change it is by changing your offensive and defensive playbooks, which can be done at any time. As you continue to target and sign players, your team needs will update accordingly. Recruiting hours. Recruiting hours are your core currency to spend on recruiting actions and scouting each week. The amount of recruiting hours you have depends on your team prestige and what part of the season you are in. Teams with a higher prestige will have more recruiting hours each week. This is meant to model the recruiting resources a program has, with higher tier programs having significantly more resources available to them. For example, in the preseason, a five-star program will have a thousand recruiting hours compared to only 350 hours for a one-star program. This will make a huge difference in a worst to first dynasty as you're trying to get better, whether you do it offline or you do it in an online mode, comparing it with your buddies. Um, whoever can recruit best and obviously have better results on the field, um, it, it's going to make a difference years down the line. In addition to the maximum recruiting hours you can spend in a week, each prospect has a maximum number of hours that you can spend on them in a given week. The default maximum is 50 hours, but this can be increased to a maximum of 70 hours with the always be recruiting ability for that position. Recruiting board. The recruiting board is where you will spend the bulk of your time in recruiting. The general layout of the board will be familiar to many. On the left, there is a list of all the recruits who are currently on your board. Each recruit shows high level information about their status, including how many hours you've allocated to them, how much you've scouted them, if you've offered them a scholarship, if you've scheduled a visit, their stage, and their interest level in your school. You can filter this list using L2 or left trigger. For example, you can filter by prospects who are ready for a visit, prospects you haven't offered a scholarship to, recruiting stage, position, and more. You can also sort the board by national rank, interest status, and recruiting stage. Of course, the board can also be manually reordered using right trigger and R2. Selecting a recruit allows you to dive in deeper and begin interaction with them. At the top of the screen, you'll see bio information about the recruit, as well as a large bar with stages on it. This bar represents the recruit's overall progression towards each stage and ultimately committing to a team. The dark area of the bar is how much the recruit progressed week over week. Within the overview tab, you can see a summary of where each school stands. Similar to the top bar, each school has their own bar, which represents their progression with the recruit. The top school's list is a zoomed in snapshot of the recruit's progression to the next stage. Once a team fills their bar, the recruit will progress to the next stage and the top school's bar will reset. Any teams below the cut line will be locked out and no longer able to talk with the recruit. Scouting. 
Before you start offering scholarships and dedicating your limited recruiting hours and resources to prospects, it's important to make sure that you're targeting the right ones for your program. During the preseason, you are only able to scout and offer scholarships, so it is a great time to scout players and ensure you're targeting the right prospects. In College Football 25, we are introducing a new scouting system designed to represent the ambiguity and progressive discovery of high school players' skills. Prior to scouting a player, you will only be able to see their star rating, their height, their weight, their hometown, their position, and archetype. You will see question marks on their attributes, abilities, and development traits. The attributes represent the top 10 ratings for their archetype. Each attribute has four states of scouting. Unscouted. This is represented by a question mark and is the default state for every recruit. Partially scouted. At this stage, you will see a horizontal bar appear. The left side of the bar is zero and the right side of the bar is 99. Within the bar is a gold zone that covers 25% of the bar's space. The player's true rating for that attribute is somewhere in this range. Mostly scouted. Once you have mostly scouted a player's attribute, you have a much clearer picture of the prospect. At this point, the gold zone only covers 10% of the bar. Fully scouted. When a rating is fully scouted, you know exactly how good the prospect is and their exact attribute rating is revealed. Each time you scout a prospect, you will reveal a limited amount of information about them. Sometimes scouting a player will fully scout an attribute, while other attributes will only be partially scouted. Additionally, each scouting action will also reveal physical and mental abilities. While abilities and attributes are able to be scouted, a player's development trait is not. When we talked with coaches about identifying a player's development trait, they overwhelmingly said it is an intangible factor that is difficult to identify without a distinct intuition and direct in-person contact with a recruit. As a result of our discussions, the primary time you will unlock a prospect's development trait is on National Signing Day. However, if you own the mind reader ability, there's a chance you will learn their development trait when you spend some time with them during their official visit. That's really cool. I like that they're incorporating all of these different coach abilities and traits and like making it make a difference. God, this game's gonna be so good. The coaches we talked with also described how the level of ambiguity and uncertainty around a player's skill set is higher for lower star rated players. This is because of how much visibility the top prospects get from social media, scouts, and high profile camps. Conversely, lower star rated recruits generally have less visibility, which leads to a greater level of uncertainty and unknown what their true skill is like. This creates an opportunity to find a diamond in the rough. I think this is also something that was happening in the older game, especially in 2014, because I would sign two star and three star players that would be better than four star gems immediately. Like they would be two star, three star gem prospects that would have a plus eight or plus six. I even had like a plus nine one time um, in, in one of my players as a two and three star that wasn't a Juco. And he was so much better than like the 68 overall, like busted player um, who was a four star recruit. This system creates a lot of variance. We have modeled this uncertainty and unknown with our gym slash bus system. When scouting a player, there's a chance you identify that their true skill is actually better or worse than their star rating indicates. For example, a four-star bust is really a three-star quality prospect, while a four-star gym has the skill level of a five-star. Of course, even if a player is a bust, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad player. A five-star bust is still going to be pretty darn good. This system creates a lot of variance in lower star rated prospects and provides you with the opportunity to build your program with high quality players who slip through the cracks of the recruiting ranking. Landing top blue chip prospects is incredibly difficult, so this can be a highly effective recruiting strategy to build your program. It's something that I've always relied on and I love finding those diamonds in the rough players who the big teams just kind of forget to recruit. And previously, you could look at players who were like not progressed in their um, in their stages. So like players would be like 16, 17% halfway through the season and no one had really been recruiting them and you can come in and swoop them up. I don't know how that'll reflect in this game, but I look forward to doing similar things here. Think back to the rise of Boise State and the consistency of Oregon State in the early to mid 2000s. Both of these programs excelled at finding gems who were under recruited and overlooked by big schools. Finding the ideal pitch. Once you've determined a prospect meets your initial criteria, it's time to begin uncovering intel about their motivations and what they care about. Remember, every prospect has three motivations that they care about. 
which comprise their ideal pitch. Your goal is to discover their ideal pitch as quickly as possible so that you know if their motivations align with your program and so that you have the information you need to when begin pitching in stage two. In stage one, there are five recruiting actions you can use to uncover information about the prospect. In addition to uncovering information, you will also gain some influence with the prospect. Each action has a recruiting hour cost and corresponding benefit. The more hours you spend on a recruit, the faster you will uncover information and the more influence you will gain. You can increase how fast you uncover information and the amount of influence you earn with the most influential ability, which gives you a bonus to recruiting action. The five recruiting Recruiting actions are as follows. Offer scholarship. Scholarships show the prospect you are very interested in. As a result, you will gain a small weekly influence bonus with the prospect after offering them a scholarship. Additionally, you will not be able to bring them on campus for an official visit or receive a commitment from a prospect until you've offered them a scholarship. Search social media. Spend some time scrolling through the player's social media to learn a little bit more about them. This will also give you a very small amount of influence when they see you liked their story. Just be careful not to like an image of them from three years ago. I really hope that's like actually a thing. <laughs> that would be so funny. DM the player. Message the player directly on social media to start a conversation and learn more information about them. DMs will give you a small amount of influence as you start to build that relationship. Contact friends and family. Make a few phone calls to the player's family and close friends to learn a lot more about what the prospect values. This action will also gain a significant amount of influence with the prospect when word gets back to them that you called and when grandma starts raving about you and your program at Thanksgiving dinner. Send the house. From the recruiting coordinator to every other coach on your staff, send every available resource you have after a prospect to gain as much influence with them as possible. As you uncover their motivations, they will no longer display a question mark. If the motivation displays a red X, the recruit does not care about it. If it displays a green check mark, this is one of the three motivations they care about. With this added depth in recruiting, we wanted to make sure that recruiting did not become a monotonous chore that took a significant amount of your time each week. With this in mind, every recruiting action is set it and forget it, meaning they will stay week over week until the recruit either locks you out, commits, or you decide to change your recruiting action. So this system is really similar to what it was, I think, back in 2006. Um, and I think it'll get into like actually pitching and stuff like that. But you can like actually sway them away from whatever their top is for other things that help to um, like make them more likely to commit to you. Um, but that's cool that it's going to be set it and forget it versus super tedious like it used to be. You had to go and set like do it every single week for every single player. And as long as you're getting your updates and seeing what level of like you know effect you're having i think the set it forget it's going to be way better stage two the pitch after the recruit narrows their top schools to five it's time to begin pitching the prospect on your school and what you have to offer by this point you should have a good amount of information about the prospect and what they care about the more information you have the more surgical you can be with your pitch if you don't have much information about the prospect you'll effectively be flying blind and risk pitching them on something they do not care about if your pitch does not align with their motivations it can actually have an adverse effect on their perception of you and your program when pitching a prospect there are two different pitch types you can use soft sell awards a moderate amount of influence when choosing the correct pitch it also limits the downside risk and penalty of pitching the prospect on something they don't care about this is best for when you have some idea of what the recruit is motivated by hard sell this provides the most influence when choosing the correct pitch but it also comes with the largest penalty if you pitch the wrong thing it is best to hard sell the recruit when you know their ideal pitch or if you are desperate and just hoping for the best I actually did this a lot of times like in the 2006 one where you would hard pitch like you could see that like national like championship contender was really important to them and like based on that like if you saw that they were kind of interested in you but they were out of state or something but they had championship contender you could go in and be like tv you know championship tv exposure and uh draft potential those three things and pitch that hard sell it like at the end of the season when you're in a recruiting battle with another top school and you really want to get this guy and like you end up like either really lucking out and like getting the recruit because you picked the right pitch based on things that you saw and kind of deducing that or you crash and burn because it was actually like um national championship proximity to home and like academics or like something like that and you just like crash and burn completely
After selecting a pitch type, you will then select your pitch. Each pitch is a collection of three motivations, and there are 20 pitches in total. For example, the Sunday bound pitch sells a recruit on your school being a championship contender, its conference prestige, and your school's track record of sending kids to the next level. How well the pitch aligns with the prospect's motivations, as well as your associated my school grades, will ultimately determine how well your pitch lands with the prospect. You can increase the impact of your my school grades with the upsell ability. If your school does not perfectly align with their ideal pitch, or if you're looking for a way to get a competitive advantage, you can sway the prospect and change their motivations. Successfully swaying a prospect will give them a second ideal pitch that is only available to you. It is possible that the second ideal pitch also creates a third ideal pitch combination as well, as a result. Your chances of successfully swaying a prospect increase the more overlap there is between their ideal pitch motivations and the pitch you're trying to sway them on. It is possible to sway them on a pitch with zero motivation overlap, but it is a very low probability of success. For example, let's say the prospect's current ideal pitch is Hometown Hero, which includes campus lifestyle, proximity to home, and program tradition. To increase your probability of success, you would want to sway them on a pitch that also has one or two of the Hometown Hero motivation. In this example, let's sway the prospect on the college experience pitch, which includes academic prestige, campus lifestyle, and stadium atmosphere. If our sway is successful, the prospect will now care about academic prestige and stadium atmosphere in addition to the three motivations they already cared about as a part of their ideal pitch. This is cool because it doesn't replace any of the other ones. It just increases the value of ones that your school has and are currently focusing on increasing the motivation of in the player. A successful sway gives you the ability to pitch two or more ideal pitches for maximum influence gain. It also provides you with the opportunity to more closely align the prospect with your school's strengths. This is an incredibly powerful action, and if used properly, it can separate you from the competition. Oh yeah, okay, so when you look at this, you can see like, it highlights the, um, it highlights the motivation that the pitch covers. So Workhorse covers pro potential, athletic facilities, and brand exposure. That's cool, I like that. Stage three, the close. The final step in the recruiting journey is to close. This is when you bring the prospect in for an official visit and attempt to leave a lasting impression with them. In order to schedule a visit with a prospect, they must be down to their top five schools and you need to have offered them a scholarship. No recruit wants to take the time to visit somewhere that won't even give them a scholarship offer. A recruit can only take an official visit to a school when they are on a bye week or they have a home game. Additionally, schools can only host up to four recruits in a single week. When scheduling a visit with a prospect, you'll be charged 40 recruiting hours. The cost to schedule a visit does not count towards the number of hours you can allocate to the recruit in a week. This allows you to continue your normal recruiting of the prospect in the same week you schedule a visit. A visit is broken down into two main parts, scheduling and activity. Timing is everything when it comes to scheduling a visit. Waiting to bring the recruit in for a big time rivalry game late in the season could have a lot of upside, but it also carries risk since there's a chance the prospect will commit somewhere else prior to your visit date. Who you play the day of the visit also matters. Every visit during the regular season comes with a set of game day stakes, which determine the influence bonus you will receive with the recruit for winning the game and the potential downside for a loss. The stakes are set by the importance and visibility of the game the prospect will attend. Let's be honest, nobody wants to go to a game in a weak environment. Playing a lower tier opponent will provide very little upside and a major downside if you lose. Conversely, playing a rival who is also a top 5 team will have the potential to leave a lasting impression. Of course you can avoid any risk entirely by scheduling during a bye week, but then you get no game related bonuses at all. Finally, the other prospects who are visiting that weekend can have a positive or negative impact based on whether or not their positions are complementary or competitive. For example, having a quarterback and a left tackle visit at the same time will give a complimentary bonus, where scheduling two quarterbacks on the same day is considered a competitive visit and will negatively impact both of their visits. After setting which date the prospect is going to visit, the next step is to select what they're going to do on their visit. There are 14 activities a recruit can do during a visit, and each activity maps to a prospect motivation. Similar to pitches, the alignment of the recruit's interest level in that activity and your My School grade will determine how much the recruit enjoys the activity. Nailing the visit can often be the difference between bringing in a top five class or being left at the altar on signing day. If things go well, there's a chance the recruit will verbally commit to your school following the visit. 
While you should feel good about securing a verbal commitment, it is critical you stay on top of things until they sign their letter of intent on signing day. If a prospect is verbally committed and they have a deal breaker, they will decommit from your school if you fall below the required grade threshold prior to signing day. Once a player is signed on signing day, you have nothing to worry about until they arrive on campus and your next challenge is keeping them happy and out of the transfer. As you can see here, the, uh, the impact with the FCS school, also the fact that they did the FCS Southeast as the Pandas and uh, not the experts like team is based out of Georgia or Atlanta or Georgia. I don't remember where in Georgia and they're the Pandas is hilarious and hopefully big ups to him if he got in the game that way. You can see the impact for a win is not really there. The loss is like definitely negative impact. The win of, for Auburn is definitely better. They're a lower tier, lower tier opponent. Hey, but it is a rivalry game. Um, and then you see a loss would really impact the recruit. Um, you can also see the attend position meeting. It shows them playing time and things like that, which would be helpful for um, for this specific recruit. It tells you like the you know the level of impact it has by the three triangles. Um, and then you can see he committed. Look at that. While you should feel good about securing a verbal commitment, it's critical that you stay on top of things until they sign their letter of intent on signing day. If a prospect is verbally committed and they have a deal breaker, they will decommit from your school if you fall below the required grade threshold prior to signing day. Hey coach, I'm sorry, but I've decided to leave. Over the last three years, the transfer portal has completely reshaped college football and how you build your roster. While it can be used to quickly upgrade your roster, it can also gut your program if a mass exodus of players heads to the exits. Just like the recruits, players on your roster can also have a deal breaker, and any recruit that has a deal breaker will keep their deal breaker when they join your roster. Remember, deal breakers can be thought of as a promise between you and the player. If you fail to uphold your end of the deal, there's a chance they'll leave in the offseason. The corresponding my school grade falling below the threshold does not guarantee that they will decide to leave. The probability of a player transferring after their deal breaker has been violated is driven by their overall with higher overall players being more likely to transfer. Keep in mind that every action you take throughout the season has a potential to impact your my school grades and therefore increase a player's chance of leaving. A perfect example is the coaching carousel, where coach firings or coaches leaving for new jobs could immediately impact a team's coach prestige grade resulting in players entering the portal. In addition to players entering the portal, high overall players may look to go pro and enter the draft if they've been in school for three or more years. Players who are entering the pro draft will display the round they are projected to be drafted in. Once a player has decided to leave, you will have an opportunity to persuade them to stay. The chance to successfully persuade a player to stay is determined by their overall and your coach prestige. Higher overall players will be harder to convince than lower overall players. However, keep in mind that you only have a limited number of persuasion attempts. The number of persuasion attempts you have is determined by your coach prestige. The higher your coach prestige, the more attempts you'll have. You can increase the number of persuasion attempts with the gift of gab ability, and you can increase your chance of successfully persuading a player to stay with the roster retainer ability. After advancing the week, you'll be able to see the pro draft results, which show where the players were drafted. When creating the pro draft results, we use real world data and pro draft trends to inform when players are drafted based on their overall and position. I think it's best if you play elsewhere. While players have the opportunity to leave via the transfer portal every season, you will also have the opportunity to make roster changes. Every offseason, you are required to get back down to 85 players on your roster. Unfortunately, that means if you are over the 85-man limit, you will be forced to encourage some players to transfer and find a new home. Even if you are at or below 85 players on your roster, you can still encourage players to transfer in order to make room for new players the next season. And no, you can't encourage the brand new freshman you just signed to find a new home the moment he gets on campus. Also, having 85 players is a lot more than what it was previously. I think it was 70. So seeing that they have 35 scholarships for you versus uh, 25 is an interesting change. The transfer portal. As we said at the beginning, one of our goals was to make the transfer portal authentically unpredictable. This begins with players leaving. Some schools may face a mass exodus of players while others may be left untouched. Once all players have decided whether to stay or go, the transfer portal will officially open at the start of off-season recruiting. Off-season recruiting lasts four weeks in total and transfers will make their final decision at the end of it on National Signing Day. Just like in real life, this is a chaotic four weeks where players are committing quickly and team rosters are rapidly changing. 
Teens will have to constantly make quick decisions, sometimes with limited information. Do you want to continue pursuing high school recruits? Are there transfers who can immediately improve your roster? How much time do you want to spend discovering a transfer's motivations and scouting them versus selling them on your program? How soon do you want to bring a transfer in for a visit? Every transfer is given a star rating based on their overall and has a national, state, and position ranking just like high school prospects. Since people change over time, transfers are assigned a new ideal pitch and motivation. Every player in the transfer portal has the same deal breaker that caused them to transfer originally. Their new ideal pitch will include their deal breaker motivation and it will be relevant to transfers and their unique needs. After their new ideal pitch and motivations have been set, transfers will evaluate every school and generate a top schools list just like high school prospects do. They will look at how their motivations align with each school and adjust for pipelines and proximity to home. Since four and five star prospects are in the highest demand and they know more concretely what they are looking for, they will only consider five schools. If you're not in their top five, you will not be able to talk with them. Lower star rated prospects will vary in terms of the number of schools they are considering. Some will be completely open, while others will have as few as three schools they are considering. Regardless of where they start, the process of recruiting a transfer is fast and you will need to make quick decisions. Your interactions with the transfer will be very similar to interacting with a high school recruit. Depending on their stage, you will add recruiting actions, pitch your school, bring them to your campus on a visit, and try and close the deal. When evaluating whether to target transfers or high school prospects, schools would need to look at each position on their roster throughout the season and monitor their immediate needs. If a position group does not meet their requirements, they will hold a spot on the recruiting board for an off-season transfer who they believe can come in and be an immediate contributor. Don't be surprised if you see teams finish early signing day with a light recruiting class in preparation for a big recruiting push in the transfer pool. Of course, once they see the players who are actually in the portal, their priorities may change. Having a need at left tackle is nice and all during the season, but if there's a five-star transfer quarterback who wants to come to your school, why turn them down? Signing day. Just like in the real world, College Football 25 features both early signing day and national signing day. Early signing day takes place at the start of the bowl season, after the regular season has been completed. National signing day takes place seven weeks after the national championship. On signing day, any players who have verbally committed to a school prior to signing day will sign, meaning they can no longer decommit. The majority of prospects will commit prior to early signing day, but some recruits may last late into the cycle. Those prospects, along with transfers, will ultimately sign their letter of intent on National Signing Day. Throughout recruiting, you can view the team recruiting rankings in the Top Classes tab of the Recruiting Hub. Top Classes allow you to view the team recruiting rankings for high school prospects, transfers, or combined. You can also filter the rankings by conference. Any recruits who are unsigned after National Signing Day will stick around and become walk-ons in the offseason. With that being said, the days of a player who was being actively recruited not committing anywhere and drifting off into the ether are over. No longer will you have to speculate and fantasize what happened to them. Did they fail to get into school because of grades? Did they have a change of heart and decide to try archery instead? Was it something you said? Now the team with the highest influence on signing day will get the player as long as they have offered them a scholarship. This was a huge quality of life improvement that we all felt was a must have and we are very happy we were able to deliver it. Yeah, nothing was more annoying than when you like had literally just up to the bar of getting the recruit and he was like a four star recruit and he just decided like not to come to you and not to play and he was like, a generational talent and just decided to go nowhere it's crazy oh there's the top classes thing that's cool <clears throat> auburn with the number three recruiting class oh <laughs> dang son big georgia 29 four stars that's crazy position changes following signing day you will have the opportunity to change player positions ahead of an offseason following signing day you will have the opportunity to change player positions ahead of offseason progression this is especially important for any athletes you signed in recruiting as they do not have an actual position. If you forget to set an athlete's position, they will be automatically assigned their primary archetype's position when you advance the week. Players will be able to change to any other position regardless of their original position. The position change spreadsheet will show you their projected overall at the new position, which archetype they would become, where they would rank on the depth chart, and the number of players at the position. Once you confirm their new position, they will receive a new set of physical abilities that are specific to that archetype. The physical abilities and tiers they receive are determined by their new ability. Mental abilities will not change unless the mental ability does not apply to their new position. Player Progression in college football, the offseason is the most impactful time period when it comes to player development. 
While players can improve during the season, the bulk of their progression and development happens during the spring and summer. Every season, we see players who put in the hashtag work during the offseason and come back bigger, stronger, faster, and overall a significantly better player. Player progression in College Football 25 is no different. All about the games. In Dynasty, players will automatically progress their attributes and physical ability. Mental abilities cannot be upgraded, allowing for greater differentiation between players. Players will progress during the season based on their on-field performance, but the bulk of their progression will happen in the off-season. Off-season progression happens after the position changes stage so that players will progress in their new positions. The amount a player progresses in the off-season is influenced by their school year, your coach abilities, and their development trait. To simulate the real-world difference in physical maturity between a freshman and a senior, younger players like rising sophomores will take larger leaps during the off-season than a rising senior. Similarly, a player's coaching staff will have a significant impact on their development. For example, motivators can have the pay it forward ability, which awards bonus XP to a position group every time a player at that position is drafted in the first three rounds. Motivators can also have the put in work ability, which increases offseason development for players in that particular position group. Progression will then be further modified by the player's development trait. In College Football 25, there are four player development traits. Normal, these players are most common and progress at a standard rate. Expect them to steadily grow over their career. Impact, the type of player that can really change a team. They'll progress faster than normal with higher upside. Star, a potential Sunday player. There are very few of these to go around and they'll establish themselves early as fast learners. Elite, the best of the best. These players will make a statement the moment they get on campus and have the potential to be an all-time great. Once a player is on your roster, their development trait is known and can be seen in the player card, which can be accessed by pressing triangle on a player on the roster. When a player is a recruit, their development trait is hidden until National Signing Day, unless you have the strategist archetype's mind reader ability, which gives you a chance to learn their development trait when they come for an official visit. Skill groups. As opposed to progressing each attribute individually, for example trucking, players will instead progress an entire skill group. A skill group is a collection of related attributes. For example, the running back power skill group includes trucking, strength, stiff arm, toughness, jumping, and injury. Every skill group has a max level of 10. Each time you upgrade a skill group, it will increase one level and progress all of the attributes in the skill group. With that being said, some players will have a skill group max level or cap that is less than 10. Skill group caps can be thought of as a player's max potential in that particular area. These will vary by player, skill group, position, and archetype. Once a skill group has hit the cap, it can no longer be upgraded unless the coach has the architect archetype and the limitless or put a ring on it ability. Limitless provides a chance to increase a random skill cap every time the player levels up, and put a ring on it provides a chance to increase their highest skill cap after winning a conference or national championship. Mental and physical abilities. As Scott described in the gameplay deep dive, players can have up to five physical abilities and three mental abilities. Both physical and mental abilities have four tiers, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Physical abilities are determined by the player's archetype, while mental abilities are position specific. While progressing, players will look to upgrade their physical abilities if they meet the rating requirement. Every tier of physical ability has an associated attribute requirement. For example, in order to have the Platinum Workhorse ability, a player must have 95 toughness. As said above, Dynasty players cannot upgrade their mental abilities. So if a player does not come in as a freshman with a particular mental ability, there's no way for them to earn that ability through progression. Impact players. Impact players are back and are a quick way for you to easily identify the key players on the team. Every team will have at least one offensive and one defensive player who's an impact player. However, unlike the past, there is no limit on the number of impact players a team can have. Explosive offenses with playmakers everywhere might have five or six impact players across the board, letting you know straight up that they got dudes and they are about to cook. Look at this Georgia screenshot here where I think four, four out of the six offensive, wait, three out of the five offensive linemen are star players. Both of their tight ends, their running back and their quarterback are all star players. Jesus. Managing wear and tear. With the introduction of the new wear and tear system, the week-to-week -week management of your players is more essential than ever before. As described in the gameplay deep dive, players can incur damage to body parts during gameplay. 
The more damaged a body part is, the more it will impact their on-field performance. In addition to on-field gameplay, players will also incur wear and tear damage during Super Sim. Each week, players will recover some of their wear and tear damage. The amount of recovery is dependent on how damaged the body part is. For example, let's say in the previous game, your running back severely damaged his right ankle and his left shoulder was only slightly damaged. The next week, you can expect his shoulder to be fully recovered and his ankle to be only slightly recovered. His ankle would then be something you would want to monitor in the next game. You could decide to sit him in an effort to allow him to get back to full health the following week, or you could play him at the risk of increasing how long it takes for him to fully recover. In an effort to ensure that players are not disappearing in big time games late in the season, we have set minimums that players will always recover to when advancing the week. You can monitor your player's wear and tear damage by viewing the health tab in their player card. To access this, go to the roster spreadsheet and press triangle or Y on a player. This screen will show his damaged body parts and associated ratings impacts. That will do it for the recruiting and player progression section of the College Football 25 Dynasty Deep Dive. That was definitely a lot of information. Um, hopefully it was as informative for you guys as it was for me. It's got me really excited to see just how um, recruiting is going to go, the transfer portal is going to go, how we can see players progress, and seeing just how good a player you can make from a freshman onto a returning senior that you talked back into coming uh, from declaring for the NFL draft. I know it's only a short time until the game releases, but all of this information is incredibly helpful um, and gives a better understanding of what the game will look like and how it will play. I hope this video was informative. I appreciate you all being here to watch it. If you did stay till the end, def definitely leave a like on the video. If you want to see more in the future, subscribe down below. Um, and if you're having trouble figuring out which dynasty team you should pick, check this video out here so that you can figure out who you're going to use. I've been Alfred Avenue. See ya. Thank you.